Welcome into the fade. I'm Clay Travis. He's Todd Furman. The divisional round of the playoffs are here. And I'm going to be honest with you, Furman. I'm going to be there Saturday for the Titans Bengals game, but I'm starting to get very, very nervous. Uh, as I said on Monday when we talked, uh, I was there in 1999, I believe, when the Titans lost to uh, the Ravens as the one seed. The Ravens went on to win the Super Bowl that year. And I was also there when the Ravens came in and won again. I think, I want to say it was like 2008. Titans were the one seed. Both times the Titans have been the one seed, they were not able to host the home playoff game for the AFC. Now, the Titans have been in three AFC championship games, but all of them have occurred on the road. Furman, just to be honest, I don't know who the Titans are going to be playing, the Chiefs or the Bills. We'll talk about that matchup, which is a fabulous one as well. But if we could just host the AFC Championship game in Nashville, that would be nice. I'll take the Bengals win and roll the dice for whatever might happen in the AFC Championship game. Obviously, you're then a game away from the Super Bowl. But my goodness, win this one and at least you're in the AFC Championship game for the second time in three years, which is a pretty good achievement. Yeah, I mean, it's a franchise that continues to fly under the radar, given its staying power and stability. When you look at what they've been able to accomplish, I mean, I've been as big a detractor of Mike Vrabel as there is, but this might be his most masterful coaching job yet. Now, of course, the season loses some luster if they go down as a home favorite against the Bengals. And to your point, that number one seed coming out of the AFC becomes all for naught. But when this football game, you have what you aspire to when the season starts, a home playoff game with a chance to go, to L.A. to play for the Lombardi Trophy. And this is a Titans team, in my opinion, defensively that hasn't been given enough credit uh, given how good they are with a trio of rushers in Simmons, in Autry, in Landry that can generate pressure, a defensive backfield that's been banged up for extended stretches but is as healthy now as they've been all year long. And I love the matchup of Christian Fulton going up against his former LSU teammates in Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. We'll see what Elijah Molden can do as potentially a slot defender against Tyler Boyd. My biggest thing, if you're the Tennessee Titans and you've had two weeks to build a game plan or let's go, you know, a week, essentially knowing who your opponent was going to be, you make the Bengals beat you left-handed. You don't want to lose this game at home because Jamar Chase goes for some ungodly number of 150 yards receiving. I mean, Joe Mixon hasn't done much. He's averaged less than four yards per carry over his last six games. And I think everything sets up perfectly for the Titans to get a win. Now, will they do so in dominant fashion and cover as a three and a half, four point favorite? That remains to be seen. Uh, but I really believe that this is the perfect matchup for them to get to that championship and let the other two teams beat each other up in what I de- deem to be the varsity game in the AFC semifinals <laughs> and the Titans are playing in the JV matchup. Okay, we'll get to the varsity game, as you called it, in a minute. Is there any impact here to Derrick Henry? This line, as you mentioned, three and a half or four, uh, which is a fairly decent favorite for the Titans at this point in time. Uh, given that most of these games are going to be fairly tight in a divisional round. Do you put any value at all on Derrick Henry returning in terms of what this line is? Oh, you have to in this particular spot. And we actually broke this down on our Bet the Board podcast and we did a deep dive on all four of these games. When you look at these two teams as far as their season-long body of work, you can understand why most books open the Titans a two and a half point favorite in this spot given their past defense numbers, given what we've seen from the Bengals, especially their current form. But the reality of it is, when you look at the Tennessee Titans, with and without Derrick Henry, this offense misses a key component. And I'm not telling fans something they don't already know, but you look at Ryan Tannehill's numbers as far as yards per attempt, you look at their ability to operate off of play action. I mean, Deontay Foreman has been nice. He's at least been able to solidify the position, but it's been kind of feast or famine. With Derrick Henry in the mix against a Bengals defensive line that's going to be nicked up. We're not quite sure exactly who's going to be out there, but we know Larry Ogunjobi definitely won't be as he was put on IR. I mean, the Bengals the last two weeks, they've shown kinks in their run defense. Yes, week 18, they didn't play a whole lot of guys, but last weekend against the Raiders, it's a little bit disconcerting that Josh Jacobs was able to run for more than five yards per carry. So if the Titans can force the Bengals to play an extra man in the box, It's going to create some outstanding matchups on the outside. And honestly, Clay, the trade that you were so excited about coming into the season hasn't bore fruit yet, but suddenly all of that gets erased if Julio Jones provides that 1B receiver or even a bona fide number two opposite A.J. Brown, and he can replicate some of the playoff success we've seen from him when he was a member of the Atlanta Falcons, albeit much earlier in his career. 
I'll mention this too, by the way. A, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Julio Jones has beaten a couple of times in the last couple of weeks of the season, including the final week of the regular season. He's gotten open by a couple of yards deep and Ryan Tannehill has missed him. So part of that, I think, is just putting on tape that he does have the wheels to still get uh, open deep. I think at some point in this Bengals game, Ryan Tannehill is going to have an option to hit Julio Jones for a big play because, as you mentioned, the play-action game with Derrick Henry back is very, very impactful. And we know A.J. Brown is a big-time playmaker at receiver, meaning Julio is going to get to go against the number two corner for either the Bengals or the Bills or the uh, or the Chiefs if the Titans were to win. So I'd say just keep an eye on that. I think Julio is poised to potentially have a pretty big game based on some of the signals we've seen down the stretch run here. Uh, let's also talk, by the way, while we're doing it, we're talking about the AFC, so let's talk about Sunday's game. Uh, the Bills now continuing to inch more and more closer, at least right now. The number of money has come in a little bit on the Bills. Line opened around two and a half. It's down to one and a half or so. How do you break down the Bills on the road against the Chiefs and in what you already referred to, Furman, as the varsity battle here? Yeah, I mean, from a number standpoint, look, you're not stealing anything by betting Buffalo here. If this number opened at three, I definitely would have had a little number grab uh, on the Bills taking a full field goal. I give odds makers a ton of credit here. They open under the key number and you're still seeing support for the Buffalo Bills. So it just goes to show what you would have seen transpire in the betting market if it opened at a field goal. When I look at Buffalo, the big thing for them that we've seen over the last couple of weeks is the emergence of a legitimate ground game. They're committing a little bit more to Devin Singletary, but as we saw from Brian Dable and what was so critical to the Bills getting off the mark quickly in frigid temperatures against New England is Josh Allen's willingness to run. I mean, Clay, he was over his rushing total before the first quarter even came to an end. They didn't have to run him nearly as much once they built the lead, but it forces defenses to pick their poison because suddenly if you're Kansas City, Tyron Matthew can't be patrolling center field, picking off an errant passer there. He's got to come up. He's got to help in run support. And you're looking at the likes of, you know, Gabriel Davis, Stephon Diggs, Isaiah McKenzie, who's flashed brilliantly against the Patriots, and Dawson Knox replicating the performance we saw at Arrowhead earlier this year where the Bills hung 38 points on the Chiefs. Meanwhile, on the other side, I do think Kansas City is going to have success moving the football. I mean, Buffalo defensively was great against New England, but Mack missed some throws. He had a couple of key drops. And Kansas City's receivers are bona fide stars compared to the likes of Kendrick Bourne and Jacoby Myers, a pair of undrafted free agents. I think this is the kind of game where the Bills would love to have a true number one corner in Tredavious White that they've been able to operate without. So I really believe both teams will get theirs. The one thing that's interesting for Kansas City, and it's a guy we clamored for earlier in the season and people kind of laugh, we're seeing finally the most explosive running back on their roster. It's Jarek McKinnon. He's got the flash, he's got the ability to catch balls out of the backfield, and he's got more big play potential in him than Clyde Edwards-Alaire. And unfortunately for the Chiefs, somewhere along the way, rubber has to meet the road. And from a political standpoint, you can understand why they've done everything to give CEH the opportunity to be the number one when you have running backs like DeAndre Swift or Jonathan Taylor that were taken after him in that particular draft. You go with the players that are going to give you the best opportunity to win. And Jarek McKinnon, bang for my buck, I, I think – is that most dynamic running back, and he's the perfect complement to the likes of a Travis Kelsey, Tyree Kill, Byron Fringle, and, of course, Miko Hardman. So I think we're in for a treat, but I'm fully on board with this line move here. I think Buffalo is the more complete team as we get into the twilight of the season. I'm on uh, the Chiefs, by the way. I think the Chiefs will find a way to win at home and advance to another AFC championship game. I think it would be, am I right about this, Furman, their fourth straight AFC championship game? Is it the fourth or the third? I mean, I know. I think it's the fourth because they, they lost to, to the Bills. Yeah, in they the lost AFC, the game to New and England. They've been in two straight Super because, Bowls. Yeah, it's a good point. They lost the game to New England because uh, Justin Houston jumped off sides or right. Ford, one of the two, the two Super Bowls. And yep, they would have a chance here. And, and it's a credit to a team that I think a lot of people went, you know, what's wrong with them earlier in the season on Sunday Night Football? But this will be their biggest test, no doubt about it. And I, I can't wait to watch this game, which in most years would probably be for the AFC title. 49ers Packers these two teams have played quite a bit in the postseason over the past several years 49ers uh, pull off the upset on the road over the Cowboys we talked a lot about that game on Monday's edition of the fade now you've got the uh, Packers sitting at home healthy 
waiting for an opportunity to get some redemption, honestly, against the 49ers. Got still issues at the quarterback position with Jimmy G and everything that's going on with his health. We know that he was not healthy down the stretch run. It's Thursday. This is one of those things that probably doesn't get resolved officially, Furman. You know this. Until Sunday, they play everything close to the vest. How do you bet this one with a little bit of uncertainty at the quarterback position? Or, Furman, are you like me and you're confident enough in the Packers, which is what I am, that I'm going to bet on the Packers even if the 49ers have their full complement? And if they don't, well, so be it. It's not necessarily going to impact things very much in a negative way. Well, I think you're right. I mean, this is all about market entry. And if you like Green Bay, best to get ahead of it. Lay five and a half if you have access or lay six. And if Jimmy Garoppolo's shoulder becomes a bigger problem uh, in the 24 hours leading up to kickoff, you have a good number and you're going to have a myriad of options. Meanwhile, if you like the 49ers, in my opinion, there's no benefit to betting this game until you have a greater indication on exactly what limitations, if any, Jimmy Garoppolo is going to have on that sprained shoulder. Because under the worst case scenario, if this was Trey Lance, the number goes through a touchdown. And I don't think anybody's walking to the window with a rookie quarterback hoping that Elijah Mitchell and Debo Samuel can kind of bridge that gap from an offensive standpoint. Green Bay is scary for a variety of reasons. We know what Aaron Rodgers is capable of. And I just want to rattle off a couple of numbers here. When you look at the Packers at home under Matt LaFleur, 24-3 and straight up, 19-8 and against the spread, a point-per-game differential of plus 10. Then you layer onto it what Aaron Rodgers has done in sub-freezing temperatures, 24 and 6 straight up, 29 and 1 ATS, a 67 to 10 touchdown to interception ratio. And you look at Jimmy Garoppolo, Clay, he's never started an NFL game in sub-40 weather. Probably the worst conditions he ever had to play in was the freezing rain of sorts against the Baltimore Ravens. And that was anything but a Picasso by quarterback standards. And then you look at Green Bay getting the likes of Jair Alexander back in their secondary. We saw Josh Myers and David Bakhtiari return to action in week 18. Randall Cobb earlier this week was upgraded. So the Packers are getting healthy at the right time. But as this number leaks out, and if Jimmy's able to go, I'll be in that minority that wants to grab San Francisco plus seven because I believe their run game travels. I think they're going to have Fred Warner and Nick Bosa that are more than capable. And I really believe the 49ers go in playing with a bit of house money. We see it all the time, maybe more in Major League Baseball than even the NFL. The 49ers coming back against the Rams gave them a stay of execution. You saw them carry some of that momentum forward. They lived a charm life against an inept Cowboys team late. And if this 49ers team is able to hang around, something that they've done in recent years against the Packers, you begin to wonder if that belief that's so hard to quantify gets them over the hump. So a plus seven with the help with Jimmy Garoppolo, even at 75%, I'll be on the Niners. Uh, but this isn't a game I've bet. Uh, and I think it's going to be an outstanding watch Saturday night on the frozen tundra. And we have to imagine our man Troy Aikman at Fox is going to be a lot more excited to call this game than he was that blowout between the Bucks and Eagles, knowing that he didn't get the opportunity to call the uh, Cowboys 49ers game that fell on an ants and Romo's plate. No doubt. Uh, all right, final game of the weekend. We saw the Rams dominate. You liked uh, the Rams. I like the Rams. I like the under. Got a couple of wins there on the Monday night football game to end Super Wild Card Weekend. Now the Rams are traveling all the way across the country from L.A. to Tampa Bay. They are a three-point underdog. I like the Rams here. I like the Rams to cover Furman. I like the Rams to win this one outright even against Brady and the Bucks. What say you? You know, this one is probably the toughest for me to handicap of the quartet of games we're going to see this weekend because... When you look at Tampa, this team is significantly better in their own building. I mean, the numbers are absolutely sickening as far as how efficient this offense has been. The Saints 9-0 loss on Sunday Night Football notwithstanding. I mean, you just pencil Tampa in for 30 points with Tom Brady under center when they're playing at Raymond James. Now, we know that Tampa's weapons are going to be a little bit limited here as they've been each of the last couple of weeks. We're going to have to monitor the status of Leonard Fournette to see if he's indeed able to go, still dealing with the lingering aftermath of that hamstring injury. I don't expect Ronald Jones on that ankle injury to play a role at all. Uh, I think he's out at least at minimum another week. But you look at the way Tampa's going to have to attack, and I think it'll be with three tight ends. I know Mike Evans had a massive day against Philadelphia, but this is a Rams team with Jalen Ramsey that can take Mike Evans out of the game. So what do the Bucs have on offense that gives them an edge? It's tight ends against a depleted Rams defensive backfield that had to bring in Eric Weddle last week, but the Rams lived in the backfield. Kyler Murray couldn't throw the deep ball. 
you didn't have to worry about the safeties covering downfield because Arizona was playing from behind early in the game. On the other side of the ball, Tampa's been very good against the run. And what we've seen from this Rams team, when they can run the ball effectively, it allows Matthew Stafford to operate with play action. And Stafford's been great all season long. One of the best quarterbacks in the league when, you know, dealing with the blitz. He struggled when he's under pressure. And I know a lot of people are going, well, aren't those two things the same? Well, no, if Tampa's able to generate natural pressure up front, they don't have to, you know, try and go man coverage on the backside. And I think they can at least neutralize Cooper Cup to some extent. So that's going to be interesting to watch and see if Stafford can continue to have a strong performance. I know he only threw the ball 17 times against Arizona, but he didn't need to once they built a three touchdown lead at the half. So when I look at this game, I think the number is perfect at a field goal at two and a half. I would make a case on a value bet for Tampa, but I actually look at the total. I think if the Rams are going to be the side here, they're going to have to be able to match the Bucks score for score. And I think it's a sneaky over here. Uh, despite two teams that exact that don't exactly have full complement of weapons. It won't be as high scoring as the first meeting, but the one thing we've seen when Sean McVay and Bruce Arians do battle, I mean, 50 points appears to be the threshold. This obviously a lot more at stake, uh, but I think both of these teams can get to 24 when you look at a total of 48. All right, get your bets in. It's fanduel.com slash clay. We will talk again on Monday, Furman. We'll have the AFC and the NFC championship set. Fingers crossed my Titans are in that AFC championship game and it's happening in Nashville. What, one last question that I have to ask for you, you know, given the wealth that you have that's generational, when does the Travis family go from just sitting with all the peons and gen pop at Titans games to having a box? So when it's adverse weather conditions, you can sit there, you can drink your light domestic beers, your black rifle coffee or whatever it may be with all, everything around you so you don't have to worry about the rain, the wind, the snow, and you can bring all the boys' friends uh, to partake in some of the festivities. I am, I am at the end of this season going to see, I don't even know what it costs to have a box for Money's the no entire season. To you. Who cares Money. what it costs? Money's no object. I it's a care what it right? costs because I used to be poor, Furman. The people who say I don't care what it costs are people who didn't actually uh, ever have to worry about money. I still look at the prices on menus, all right? Doesn't mean that I'm not, uh, I order whatever I want on a restaurant menu now, but I still look at the prices and it's been only I still like look the at the last... price. Well, that may be the best line. I think that's the best clip of the, everything we've done. I still look at the prices. The prices don't serve as a deterrent, but I at least know what the prices are. I still you're, look at you're, the you're price. I the used to, it used to be a deterrent firm and I would never order the most expensive thing on the menu. Now I just order whatever I want. But I still have to look at the price of what the box is before I agree to buy one. That's the truth. Also, okay. the other thing is, I'm on the road so much. There are lots of Sundays now where I'm on the road for college football and I might not be back home. And then I've got to figure out how to get 20 seats distributed and everything else. So I'm going to look into it. Haven't done it yet. The hardship. The hardship. The hardships. If you try to figure out how to distribute 20 seats, you have a wonderful staff located in Nashville from the Outkick team. You have a lot of family members, the ones that still talk to you. Something tells me you'd find an easy way to fill the box most weeks with the annual trip from Jacksonville probably being the lone exception. FanDuel.com slash Clay. Get your bets in so I can afford that box. FanDuel.com slash Clay. He is Todd Furman. I am Clay Travis, and this has been The Fade.